another Monday is here, and I just figured I'd throw you guys some more photos and comments and a few little short stories and that kind of thing. And some of the stuff I've run into, I was, uh, I can always think of uh, stories to tell. And the problem with telling really old stories is sometimes they seem so old that, you know, other than uh, entertainment, you don't really, you really get a lot out of them. So I try to mix some old and some new stuff together. But one of the things I, I see a lot of the times nowadays is people beside, you know, in a parking lot or wherever with their hood up. You know, I posted one last week of a guy stopping in an intersection fixing his car <laughs> and all that. And, uh, I always wonder what these people are doing. You know, I could you know, go over and stick my nose in their business, I guess, and walk up and say, hey, what you working on? and all that but I just figured <clears throat> when I see it I, I have a camera I carry around with me with a telephoto lens on it and I'll just take a picture of stuff like this you know and share it with you guys and this right here is a 68 Chevel that they're working on makes you wonder what kind of power plant they got under there if it's a 350 or 396 or whatever it is uh, my wife had a 69 Chevelle 396 that was brand new that she drove for a while she said it was one of the most muscled up cars that she ever had she had a lot of different cars but Anyway, <clears throat> that one there was one that I saw out there next to a, a business establishment with some characters working on it. Now this right here was this parking lot work that I had to do. It was the, This is basically a picture of a diesel rabbit that you're seeing. And I had one of the, I've, had, I've owned three or four of these and uh, I was working at the dealership. I got to where I was really familiar with them. And I drove this one to Savannah. Um, and it was, uh, this was going to be back in probably, I'm going to say 1994 or whenever I drove over here on this thing. I went over there several times and the thing got so much so good a fuel economy I hated to drive anything else. Had air conditioning on it and all that, so it was a comfortable little car. But uh, the belt was making a little rack and I heard a rattle under the hood. And here I was 300 and something miles from home in Savannah. Went to visit my boys over there when they were young kids. And I reached down there and I felt the water pump pulley and it was just rattling around loose. And I said, oh brother, now the bearings are going out in the water pump. And it would be foolhardy to try to drive that thing 300 and something miles not knowing if you were going to make it or not. And so I told the boys, I said, I'm going to put a water pump on this rabbit. There's just no two ways about it. And uh, it's good when you know how to do this stuff yourself and you don't have to hire somebody to do it. right? So I went and... Park, went to the park store and I bought a $28 water pump because they had one on the shelf. And a lot of these cars were still running around back then. And in order to get that water pump on there, it was the, the part of the water pump was up behind the idler pulley for the timing belt. And if you went by the shop manual procedure, you're supposed to pull the timing belt off to do this. I didn't want to fool with that. So what I did was I did this, this little sneaky thing we did at the dealership. I loosened, I mean, I took the bolt out that was. The, uh, the bearing in that outer pulley is our big old outer gear or whatever. I eased that thing out just enough and left it on its, on its boss that was sticking out there. You know, the bearing went on the boss and then the, bo the bolt went into that threaded hole in the middle of that boss. So I slid that pulley out, sneaked the water pump out from behind it, scraped the gasket, cleaned it up, put the new water pump back in there, buckled it up tight slid that thing back in. I didn't have to pull a timing belt off. Saved myself a whole heck of a lot of time. Got my arm greasy all up in my elbow, you know, and diesels are. And uh, managed to get that thing fixed. Uh, on that, on a, another trip out there by the motel where I like to stay, we stayed a little cheap Motel 6. There was a guy that was out there and he was trying to put a water, I mean a fuel pump on an old Chevy pickup had a 350 in it. And he didn't have no earthly idea how to uh, get that you know, that rod that comes down there that drives the fuel pump on M350. Um, some of those things had a hole where you could take a, a bolt out and put a longer bolt in that hole and it would hold that rod up. Or you could get some heavy grease and stick it in there. But if you didn't have a way to shove that rod up or keep it up in there, putting that fuel pump back in with a booger bear. And you also had to have the cam turned, you know, so that the, it would go up in there as far as it could. Anyway, we helped with that some too. That was some parking lot work. And um, I stopped one time at a Hardee's or something to eat. There's this boy and this girl out there on this station wagon Ford. Battery had gone dead on it. Somehow or another there was a bad connection at the uh, starter relay. 
I, I fixed that. And that's really something how you can fix something for somebody never intended to charge them for it, but it's about the time you get it fixed, they jump in the car and run off because, like my friends, you go ask them for some money or something. Anyway, the, there was another guy I stopped to help beside the road that was his choke was stuck shut on his uh, doggone uh, old mobile or whatever it was. Uh, he was sitting there and he had a gas can. His wife was pregnant. She was in the car. And uh, I saw that he, he had it had choked down and quit on him because he had driven it uh, from about 20 or 30 miles. It was still warm, but the choke was completely closed hard. And so I got a paper clip or a piece of wire or something to wire the choke open. He told his wife to match the gas pedal all the way to the floor and start the car. And when she did, it cleared out, you know, dried the gloves off and cleared it out. And, and I told him, that's going to be cold natured, but you'll be okay, you know. But that's some of that, like I say, it's some of that beside the road work that you run into on that kind of thing. This was a 72 uh, Impala that I had for a while. And that that's my mom standing there, you know. We were on a trip out. She wanted to go to the Grand Canyon. Of course, when we got there, she didn't think much of it. It's amazing to me. I thought the Grand Canyon was astonishing. But, and I went there twice. But we were just close to Mule Shoe, Texas, and, I, and the thing threw the belts off of it. And so yeah, I had noticed it here, the noise under the hood, and I kept seeing little pieces of black stuff in the road behind me. And finally, when the alternator light came on, I said, oh boy, it's a problem. So I pulled over by the side of the road, and looked, and sure enough, the belts had gone, you know, it threw the belts off of it. And I had a spare set of belts in the trunk which I usually carried a spare set of V-belts when I had anything that had V-belts. I always carried extra belts and tools to put them on with. And so I changed out the belts right there out there on the road about a mile to the uh, east of Mule Shoe, Texas. And after I changed the belts out, I went to start the car and, the, and it, you turn the key and it seemed like it had battery power, but nothing would, you know, the starter wouldn't spin. And so uh, I left, I rolled the windows down in the car, I left my mama sitting there reading a book. And I ran, started running to Mule Shoe, and I ran about halfway there. And this old couple stopped and picked me up and gave me a ride. And I had him drop me off at this gas station. I got this guy, and I said, hey, I need you to know, jump me off. I guess, a, a, you know, car through the belts, I guess it killed the battery. Uh, you know, because if you drive a while without the alternator putting out right, the battery goes dead. So I went back down there, we hooked the jumper cables up. The guy, the goofy guy was wearing coveralls, and he was a gas station filling pump. Looked like He looked like a filling station mechanic, but he didn't even know how to hook up jumper cables. I don't know what his deal was. I hooked up the jumper cables, couldn't get anything out of that thing. So I reached up into there with my using my pocket knife to go from the big terminal on the, you know, the battery terminal on the solenoid to the little S terminal on the solenoid, and it spun it over and fired it up. And I said, okay. So I paid that guy five bucks for his trouble, and I said, you know, I don't want to jack this thing up with a bumper jack and get under it and have a car fall on me. That'd be a bad way to end this trip. So we stopped at a gas station over close to the Colorado River, and this uh, guy with big frizzy afro hair and blue eyes came out. And, nice guy, and, uh, we raised it up on the lift and we put a piece of, you know, we put a little lug wire. We uh, got a wire with a lug on it and a, and a uh, butt connector of all things. And we fixed it where I could start the car, you know. The fuse link was burned in two right there by the starter like they do sometimes. I mean, and why that happened when the same time the belts came off of it, I don't have any idea. That's one of them things that were one thing didn't cause the other, but they happened at about the same time. That just didn't make any sense to me. Unless, you know, I don't know, I'm not, there's no conjecture here, but you know, you can tell how, you know, customers sometimes will have the idea that correlation of, when, of them happening at the same time means that you caused this problem. Uh, but I could not in my mind figure out how the belts doing what they did had burned the fuse link at the starter. It's just one of those things and we had it figuring out what to do was something I was able to do and we got it going. The guy just charged me three dollars to fix that wire at a gas station, go figure nice guy. Now this right here was a marsh buggy that was built by the guy that was the executive vice president of the company I worked for down in Texas. He designed this from scratch. He used a, he, he bought a junk car that was a Ford Pinto and he put this Pinto engine and transmission in here, you know, a little four-speed manual transmission. And he put a the rear axle back here and he put these brake drums with, he had some special made sprockets for, for 100 link chain and he put a, on this on this drum thing that he had the welders build and we had a really good welder down there uh, you know he put these uh, these things here you see are, are these cleats that he put on those uh, big metal drums or, uh, to give him traction out there in the marsh those were basically pieces of angle iron welded to that 
and over here, this in the driver's seat, there was two master cylinders he mounted and two levers. There are no steering wheel, but when you'd pull the right hand lever, you know, the master cylinder would apply this brake, and when you pull the left hand lever, the master cylinder would apply that brake. So he basically steered it like you would a bulldozer or a tank or something. And initially, he had a wheel back here that was like a bush hog wheel, but he decided to go ahead and just put this point back there and let it slide around in the uh, in the slush back there. In the, in. So he takes this thing out there for a trial run into this uh, swamp. Way out here. You see that? You see that X down there? He went. This was uh, Sabine Pass, Texas, down here. And I worked right down this area right here. This is north. I'm going that way. I got the map upside down. And we worked here. And he came back to get me. And he had taken a guy with another marsh buggy out there just in case he got in trouble. And he got in trouble. And so he had driven this thing, had taken this thing down here and offloaded it off the truck and went out here into the marsh with it to see how it performed. And while he was out in the marsh with it, the timing belt jumped on that Pinto engine. And so he had to come get me and take me out there to the uh, doggone uh, marsh. And you know, had to just take a bath and off because there were mosquitoes and dragonflies out there. It was the summertime and you know how it is anytime. Only place I ever saw mosquitoes worse than that was in Montana, believe it or not, when we were up there. And those things were just a mess up there. But the point is, I went out there and I put the timing belt on it, put the radiator back on. The radiator was in front of the engine. I had to pull the radiator off, get to the engine, pull the time, you line up the timing marks and the loads didn't bend valves. And uh, put the timing put the timing belt back on it that we put out there and got it going again. And uh, anyway, he managed to bring it back out there. I don't know if he ever accomplished his object objective and took anybody out there uh, duck hunting with that buggy or not, but it was supposed to be something he was going to try to do to, you know, wine and dine some of the duck hunters and all. And, uh, anyway, that was, an, that was a grand adventure. I had to use the company, which I never did this, but I had to use the company steam cleaner to get all the dragonflies and crud off of my windshield because they had just kicked my windshield when I was driving down that beach road. Now this beach road, it used to go all the, all the way, it ran next to the beach down here and it went all the way to Galveston. Well, the beach road between Sabine Pass and High Island has been washed away three times and they finally quit rebuilding it, you know, that road. And so now the road that we went down to get to right here is not there anymore. I mean, it's, it's gone. And so uh, the, this right here, I just had to pull up the Google map and draw the way that we went because there's, you know, nowadays, that's not there anymore. And this basically went and it turned and went to Galveston down that way. All right. Now then, this was me at the Ford place in the 1990s. I did a commercial for the dealership right there. I had to put the MDS machine there and the SBDS machine there and a car here. So, was, you know, these were basically just, we put those there for props and all that. And this was the time when I was on the news. We were talking, I was talking about oxides of nitrogen. This is really kind of interesting that uh, news girl called and she says, do you mind uh, talking to us about oxides of nitrogen because we're going to do a news report on it? And she says, I've called all over town. This is a town of like 60,000 people with a lot of repair shops. And she says, we can't find anybody at any repair shop anywhere that will talk to us about oxides of nitrogen. And I said, yeah, I'll talk to you about oxides of nitrogen. And so I went and uh, she says, so she turned on the camera and she pointed it at me and she said, all right. And I start talking about oxides of nitrogen. And so I talked about oxides of nitrogen for about five minutes. And then when I watched the news report that night, they used about six seconds of the five minutes that I talked about it. <laughs> anyway, but, um, but those two pictures were, these are screen grabs from little short videos that I did and all that. But uh, it's really something how you, you know, how you look whenever you're, uh, looking at yourself on video. This one right here, I actually wrote the words that I had to say and in spite of the fact that I wrote my own lines, it took me 45 minutes to get them right. I didn't smile the right way, I didn't stand the right way, I didn't turn the right It was just a big mess. But finally, when I got through, I made a pretty decent commercial out of it. The only time I ever made a commercial, I don't think I want to make another because it's too much trouble. All right. Now this right here is setting the cam synchronizer without the tool something I came up with. I wanted to be able to do this without uh, having to have that little old tool if I, was a, if I ever needed to. You know, they make a tool so that whenever you set the uh, 
balancer on zero, you're supposed to set the cam synchronizer a certain way, you know, line it up with your tool and all that. And I said, well, let me see when this thing is set up right, when it makes it switch. And so what I figured out was, if you're turning this this way, uh, that little slot is at 24 degrees after top dead center. So if you go to TDC right here and you make your mark, okay, and then I've got this light on, when I turn that pulley, as soon as it got to that 24 degrees after top dead center, it would turn that light off. That's where it was making it switch when the cam synchronizer was set right. Believe it or not, when I started researching this on those uh, CSFI Chevys, they made their cut at 24 degrees after top dead center too. And I would contend, and also I remembered um, whenever we were doing schooling with the Intelligent Video Learning, learning System and those big laser discs and all, and when we were first hearing about the uh, Oh, the uh, ignition systems only like the 89 Rangers when they first went with the uh, coil pack ignition and also on the uh, SHO Tauruses that came out in 89. They kept talking about the cam synchronizer was switching its signal at 24 degrees after top dead center. And my contention was that's when the fire has burned out so that it'll know when it can squirt its next squirt of fuel. Uh, it's interesting to me that Chevy and Ford and also those older Fords all made their cam synchronizer switch at 24 degrees after top dead center. Now you can tell what that is on these Fords, you know, if you've got a, the marks are on the, fly, on the uh, balancer, you can basically measure, you know, you put a piece of tape on there, uh, like masking tape or whatever, and make it so that you're going to 24 degrees by those marks and then move that piece of tape so that it's 24 degrees, you know, you're 24 degrees after which if you're going this way, that's 24 degrees after. And it was interesting to me, that's where they put that notch, was 24 degrees after top dead center. And I would turn that thing, and when I got into that 24 degree mark, if that thing didn't make it switch, I'd stop. And I would turn the, the cam synchronizer. I have a little LED, you know, a little logic probe here. And that little LED, when I would adjust it so that it was making it switch right there at that spot, with that light, you know, watching that light, moving it back and forth, this way, this way, you find it. And then we lock it down. You could put that tool in there at that point with it on zero, and it would be perfect. And so I said, okay, I know how to do this without having to buy a tool. Uh, now, the problem on the Chevrolet, if the Chevrolet, the CSFI, the cam sensor is built into the distributor, like on some of the old Jeeps. Now, the problem with having the cam synchronizer out of sync in the distributor is all it's not changing the timing all it's doing is changing the rotor alignment and the cam synchronizer switch and so if you get it far enough out on one of those CSFI engine it begins to bank fire the injector and your gas mileage goes to pot a lot of people would complain about that anyway I would always set that on 24 degrees after which would give me the same results as setting the uh, you know cam retard offset using a scan tool I thought that was very interesting Okay, this Camry expansion curve ball, that valve curve ball, um, we had one that we put the gauges on it and uh, with a full charge and everything like it was supposed to be, uh, every other kind of way, it would pull both sides down low. All right, that's uh, pointing to an expansion valve. You notice this little tube right here is connected to that so it can regulate the flow of the uh, liquid. In other words, you, this, is, this is taking the place of your fixed orifice. So basically you've got uh, liquid refrigerant coming to here and it's turning into low pressure liquid going into the evaporator uh, and then it's that be here and uh, going into the evaporator and then it's coming back out going to the compressor. So this thing right here was pulling both the low and the high side down. I said well it's going to have to have an expansion valve so my, my guy, my student, he pulled it apart and he put an expansion valve on it. did it right. Did a good job of it. And uh, But the stupid thing was still pulling both sides low. And so I said, well, I don't know what else it could be except the evaporator. That's a crazy thing there. So we took, we got an evaporator, and when we put the evaporator on there, the pressure is normalized, the, car, the AC got cold, and I even took and blew some air through the uh, evaporator, and I couldn't see where it was restricted in any way, shape, or form. But on that one, an expansion valve, which usually fixed that kind of problem, didn't fix that one, and we had to replace the evaporator. That's the only time I ever saw that. But, and it was on an old Toyota Camry. Now this Honda that I had mentioned previously uh, was one that uh, I didn't figure this out. 
there was a guy named Richard Sheffield that came to teach a class back when carport art parts was a thing. And he came to my program, he taught a class, he said, you got a car that runs? I said, well, I got, the only car I got right now that runs, it's a trainer car, is an 87 Honda Accord. And he said, well, bring it in. We're going to go ahead and do a little bit of, you know, checking on it and everything to see what we see. So he looked at it, he saw some white smoke, come, uh, blue smoke coming out of the exhaust pipe. He says, let's measure the compression. We measured the compression. It was 275 PSI, which was a little bit high for an older Accord like that. And he said, I've got a, I'm, I'm suspecting something here, so let's check the waveform. So he hooked up this counselor here, and he got this waveform on that Snap-on counselor. All right, so he looked at it, and he says, that cam timing is advanced on the camshaft one tooth ahead of where it should be. And... I never, we didn't investigate whether it was or not while he was there, but the next time I, we were doing a little bit of engine work, I had some of my students bring that thing in, pull the timing cover off. You know how aggravating we're on them older Hondas. Got them off, lined up the crank mark. This son of a gun was one tooth off, just like he said it was. And he basically looked at the smoke, looked at the compression, and measured the vacuum waveform, and that's how he came to that conclusion, which I thought, you know, sometimes you, you in this business, you just got to, know that sometimes there are people smarter than you are, and that's just all there is to it, you know. Uh, this guy really knew what he was doing, and I was impressed with that. Uh, but one way or another, uh, when we put the this thing back in time, the blue smoke went away, the compression normalized. We didn't remeasure the vacuum waveform, but I'm telling you, he knew what he was talking about. That was, that was good stuff. Um, all right, this right here is a ball joint tool in action. We're going to zoom in on this thing while we're working. It's always good to put some grease on those threads anytime you're using something. When you're using threads for some heavy duty pulling, always grease those threads. If you don't, you'll be sorry and you'll have to put out a lot more. Alright, see we're pushing that ball joint out of there. I always loved for the students to do ball joints because that was something they knew how to do. I had one student that would never do ball joints no matter what I told him. I kept saying, you need to know how to do ball joints and he just didn't want to fool with that. He thought it was unnecessary. I mean, you know, you can't tell him nothing. And so uh, he managed to get himself a job at some little old shop in a small town over there. And the first ticket they handed him was ball joints. He didn't have a clue what to do. Uh, you know, and I should have forced him to do it. But the thing about it is, you know, it's really, it's possible for a student to get just enough uh, of a score to pass and still not know a lot of the stuff they need to know how to do. I had another student that would not take a... a uh, a front strut off of the car and pull it apart and put it back together. That was the worksheet he was supposed to do. And he kicked that one down the road because he didn't see any point in it. And so the following semester he was in there and he was having to put a timing belt on one of these vehicles where you had to pull the strut off. And rather than taking the three nuts off the strut and the two on the bottom, he just put his impact wrench on that bolt in the middle. And when he took it loose, he burned all the thing pops apart under there. And I said, what in the world were you thinking? You know, it makes you look like a fool whenever you you know, you don't even know how to pull a strut off of a car. And, you know, if he'd have done it like he was supposed to the previous semester, we'd have been a lot better off. This is spiral bevel like the old cars you had a long time ago and a hypoid gear set, which means, notice how this one's coming in right in the middle. A hypoid gear set is always coming in above or below the center line. That is a stronger, quieter design. But these gears are matched. If you don't have those, if you've got the mismatched gears, like if you just... Say, well, I'm just going to put the ring gear from this other axle. You know, you got to swap out the ring gear and the pinion in pairs. Because if you don't, and if you don't set them up right, that thing will sing like you would play. Ying, ying, ying. You'll hear all kind of racket back there. If you set them up the right way, and that's another, you know, I've talked about that before over here. Then you'll have a good, quiet, strong, high point gear set. This blower resistor issue I talked about the other day. I was looking for this picture and couldn't find it, and then I found it. Uh, this was a blower resistor that had heated those wires up. As that current's flowing through there, and those terminals start to oxidize, and they build resistance. Whenever they build resistance, they build heat. When they build heat, they cook the insulation off, and then they start to oxidize some more, and then you wind up with all of this uh, corrosion that appears on this, on this copper wire and all. So if you run into a situation like this where you got a, the blower has quit working, you look under there and you see this hogwash, you're going to need to buy a pigtail, and you're going to need to buy a blower resistor. And you also need to look at your blower, because you may have some cooked terminals on that one, too. And that was what the blower resistor deal was all about. I wanted to cover a little bit of that. Now, here's your fast factoid. 
PSIG is a pressure measurement that considers sea level pressure as zero. In other words, you're starting at sea level pressure and you're going up from there. PSIA is a measurement of pressure that begins at a perfect vacuum. PSI actuals, okay? So a tire pressure of 30 PSIG would be, uh, would measure 44.7 PSIA. Just, you know, uh, take that for, you know, what you will. That's just a little bit of a fast fact to it. I had this printed and I had it stuck on the wall over there so that the students could look at that. I don't know how many of them remembered it, but there it goes. Now, this is an old Poppin' Johnny tractor engine from the 1920s that the guy at the local country store had put together several years ago. And he had that thing pulling these two ice cream freezers, which was cool as all get out. And uh, it was interesting because it would only fire its spark plug and its combustible mix about every few, you know, the flywheels and the momentum was what it was dependent on. And if you're listening to it run, it would go bup, 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 And every time it made that loudest pop, it was firing. And that was, you know, that would add more momentum, more momentum to those. And, I, and the fact that they could use that on a tractor just totally blows me away. But anyway, they call that a popping Johnny. And when somebody would make it fun of one that was running bad, they'd say it was popping like a John Deere tractor. And that's what they were talking about. All right. You see the problem right here? You know, whenever you're working in the dark, you won't have a, you never know, notice how, when I was young and when my students are young, you know, my dad used to tell me, why don't you put some light on what you're doing so you can see what you're doing? And I used to have to tell students the same thing. Put a light under there so you can see what you're doing. I think, oh, I see this fine. And they get under here and they uh, put a starter on there. And then it, as soon as they hook the battery terminals back up, the dadgum starter goes to spin like that. And, and that, uh, so what they did was whenever they put that on there, you notice how this is touching that. And that's a major disaster there. And if they can't think fast enough, they're going to run the battery down, and eventually they could probably damage the starter by wah, 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 you know. Low voltage will burn a starter out, something fierce. Um, but anyway, that was what, that was something. Nice. That little tang right there is supposed to be right in here, and it's supposed to locate that. But somehow they managed to get it put on there where it was out of place, and it was, when they tightened that up, this was touching that. So that's one of those things that students have to learn not to do. I mean, just... Putting it on there and tightening the nuts without paying attention to how these things index is going to be a problem. And so that's just something they needed to learn. They've really got this out of place, too. It was supposed to be somewhere else. So that was the perfect storm. These two came together and made a big problem. This is adding fluid to an old dipstick transmission. There's a standpipe in there, kind of like in your commode, you know. Got to have the fluid at a certain temperature because fluid transmission fluid expands and contracts with pressure. Um, there was a guy that I know that has a really nice used car dealership that uh, called me a couple of days ago. Or well, he actually, yeah, he either called me or texted me or whatever. But anyway, we were, he says there, there's a, we got an expedition over here. It's got 20,000, I mean, it's the 2020 model and it's got 75,000 miles on it. There are no transmission leaks anywhere. There's no transmission fluid in the coolant, uh, but it's two quarts low on fluid. And the, the guy that's driving it noticed the transmission was not quite working the way it was supposed to. And when we checked the fluid uh, with the, uh, you know, everything at 200 degrees or whatever, they had to warm the transmission up, driving it and all that stuff. Uh, and looked at the scan tool. They checked the fluid and it was two quarts low. So they had to add fluid. And after they added fluid, the transmission started working right again. And so, I, uh, you know, you've seen power steering fluid. I mean, if you're like me, you've seen power steering systems that didn't have a leak that you can see anywhere go low on fluid because of it, fluid evaporation or something like that, as weird as that sounds. But I got a hold of this uh, boy over here that I had placed at the Ford dealer that's so, he, uh, back in 2005 or six or whatever it was, he graduated and he went to work over there and he is really, 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 really sharp. He, he does transmissions and everything. But the point is, I asked him about that and he says, well, sometimes the fluid goes low in those but I don't know why, uh, unless it's fluid evaporation or something. But see, if it was pushing it out the vent, it seems like you should see fluid under there. Uh, but the guy that called me about it initially said there was no leak they could find anywhere. It was dry as a bone under there, but it was still two quarts low. And so that's sort of a mysterious thing. Some of you guys might be able to weigh in on this. If you know the answer to how the fluid gets gone when there's no leak, let me know, because that's a very interesting thing to me. Anyway, there's a lot of uh, transmissions, and I've talked about this in other videos, that now uh, they don't have a dipstick. And putting the fluid in is, you know, something you got to do 
uh, silly stuff like this. Uh, but, you know, Volkswagens, you know, some of them are like that too, so it's not just the Fords. Okay, this one right here, some people just like to keep on driving them. This is obviously a car that's been totaled out, but because it would still drive, see, he's got good tires on this thing too. Because he could still drive it, he put, he tapes plastic over the windows and just keeps on driving it. Had to wire the trunk shut. Um, and I'm not too worried about you seeing that license plate because this picture is about seven or eight years old. But the funny thing about it was, this was at that country store where I used to eat. It's over here. This is an old uh, building they had. That was a tool shed thing that were the old tools out of there. But there was a Toyota Camry, like an 03 model, that somebody used to drive, and they would park it next to the automotive department over there. And they had backed that thing into a pole going about 40 miles an hour or something. It had caved the back of that car in all the way up to the back glass. Somehow miraculous. It didn't break it. But wow, and like I say, if the thing will keep running and it's got tail lights that'll work and headlights that'll work, you know, when I first took my driver's test in Alabama, the only thing you were required to have was one tail light, two headlights, and you had to know your hand signals. That was the requirements, you know, back in the 70s, early 70s. Uh, but everything's different now, obviously. Don't forget the cabin air filter. You know, some of the Lexus cars have got um, horseradish in the cabin air filter to kill bacteria. And some of the other Lexus models have got an infrared light that shines on the cabin air filter all the time to kill bacteria. But this is something that's very easy to forget if you're not careful. So always check that cabin air filter as a part of a regular, you know, sometimes it'll be out there. Uh, in the cowl area where you got to pull something off in front of the windshield, most of the time nowadays is inside the car, um, and it's uh, you can typically look it up. Not every vehicle has one. Uh, we have three vehicles at our house, and none of our three vehicles have a cabin filter. Uh, my wife's uh, pickup is a 2016 F-150. I got a 07 F-150 and a 06 Explorer. None of ours have cabin air filters. Some of your GM cars, like Montana vans and stuff some of your pickups. They'll have cabin air filter and they'll be in there behind the glove box. The common place is behind the glove box or right in the center of the bulkhead, you know, like where your transmission tunnel would be if you had one of those. And uh, so uh, the Tesla cars have got a great big old filter, a big old heap of filter out in the middle. It's just a huge thing. And then they'll have another cabin air filter inside. And some of the Tesla cars have got it out there by the windshield I mean, or when you open the hood, it pulls out out there. I mean, there's just all different ways. you got to find out where it is on the car you're working on. Uh, but you'd be surprised how many times you'll pull that cabin air filter out, and it'll be clogged up and crappy like this one right here. Double check everything from every angle you can. Uh, of course, obviously, the bolt hadn't been put in this yet. Uh, but if you look at that, if somebody puts the bolts in there, and they wind up with this thing here, you know, uh, distort the seal or something like that or not tighten it up because you're going to have a leak there. So I always like to get down there with my camera and take a picture. Now that you've got a cell phone on your hip all the time or on your toolbox, uh, you can turn the flash on on that thing and get it set, you know, so that you'll have a good focus on it. Take a picture. You'll see stuff in a picture you have taken that you would not see with your naked eye. You can look with a mirror, but why not go ahead and take a picture? That way you got a record of it. Um, all right, now this ragged 87 Pontiac might have been worth $100 sitting beside the road with a for sale sign on it. And she said that her cousin had replaced the intake manifold gasket, but the engine, and the engine had started skipping after he did that. And he would put plugs in it, but that's all he knew to do. So she brings it to us, and I noticed that the number three injector was going cluck, cluck, cluck instead of click, click, click. It didn't sound like the other one was a stethoscope. And so I, initially I went ahead and just popped an injector in it because I figured that must be what was wrong with it, but that didn't change anything. And so then I, I went through all the schmear of checking pin fit, running a wire harness overlay, just did everything I could possibly think of to figure out why when I hooked up the di dynamic data collector that these, uh, this was a normal injector pattern. That was the one, this problem injector. Of course, you've also got this right here going on, which I thought was very interesting. And so I kept fooling with this thing. I says, I don't, I think I'm just going to get a, a, a you know, used engine controller. Because back in those days, it was plug and play. You know, you buy an engine controller, you plug it in, there you go. Uh, and this was pre-OBD2. 
So I called the salvage yard and he goes, oh, I got a bunch of them. Uh, so I sold them to you $20 a piece. I said, well, Mountain, send me a couple of them just because. And so I put the first one on there. Everything was exactly the same. Put the second one on there. It was exactly the same. Nothing changed. Wire harness overlay, pin fit. I measured the resistance of the injector. Seemed like, if I'm not mistaken, it was 15 ohms. I measured how much current the injector was pulling. Now, I didn't do a current ramp of it, but it was only pulling eight-tenths of an amp, uh, which was the same thing all the other injectors were pulling. And I said, this is the wackiest thing I've ever seen. Well, the girl needed to go home, so I went ahead and scotch-locked the trigger wire for this injector to the injector next to it, and it ran smooth as silk. It skipped. Everything was wonderful. The pattern, this, pat this pattern was matching the one next to it because I just scotch like the wire. This was going to be a temporary fix, right? I mean, if I had gone make a permanent fix like that, I was going to, I would have soldered them, but I scotch locked it. Because she needed to drive, and she lived about 40 miles from the school. She said, I'll bring it back tomorrow. I said, well, you know, if it craps out on you, you know, it's going to be a problem. She said, I don't care. I'll take the chance. I'm just going to go home on it. So the next day she came back and she said, this car runs so good that I don't want you to do anything else to it. I said, really? And it, and she, it was sitting there running smooth as silk instead of the pup, 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 pup that it was doing before. She said, I don't think we need to do anything else to it. I'll just drive it like it is. Well, I talked to a General Motors engineer about this thing, and he was totally mystified. He said, I have no idea what might cause that. It doesn't make any sense. It's a sequential system, sequential fuel injection. Uh, he said, I just don't get it. And I said, well, am I going to overload the driver by putting those two injectors together? He says, no, on that particular uh, ECM, the drivers will handle 4 amps, and you've only got that driver pulling 1.6 amps, so it should be good indefinitely. And so that's a uh, sort of a screwed up way of fixing something, you know, patching it like that. But uh, I guess, you know, she was happy with it, and that's all we needed to do. And, you know, she paid for the injector and all that. Why it started skipping after her cousin or whoever it was, we checked for vacuum, you know, air leaks and all that kind of junk. And didn't find anything there, so he had done a good job putting that intake gasket on it. But it's just the wackiest thing I could, I never, there's some mysteries you just don't ever solve. You know what I mean? Now, I did talk to an instructor one time at one of the training conferences I went to, and he was, uh, some of these instructors are really full of themselves, you know. And I, 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 I had took a second and I gave him a quick rundown on this. And uh, basically the way he came across was, he says, well, I can't tell you from what you're telling me what was wrong with it, but if I was standing there with that car in front of me, I could figure it out in 10 minutes. And the way that that guy came across to everybody in, the, in that class was, you know, I can figure out any problem any of you guys has in 10 minutes, and if you can't, you're an idiot, you know. I mean, the thing about it is, you know, he was a really, really, really good instructor as far as knowing what he was talking about. You know, when you come across like there's, you know, there's nothing I can't figure out, nothing I can't fix, you know. You know, you just sort of, you know, kind of blow that off. Anyway, valve cover gaskets on this one were an absolute bear. Uh, this is like an 08 Jeep, as I remember that he was working on. And this guy right here was a trooper. He worked and worked and worked on this thing. These valve covers are so doggone thin. I mean, they're just almost, I'm not going to say they're paper thin, but it's really, really easy to break them. You can put those things on there. See how you, you got to pull all kinds of crud off to get to those, get those valve covers on, off and on there. And uh, he put the valve covers on and worked really hard doing it. And then the guy that brought it back says, "Oh, this is not safe to drive and all that." And I said, "What are you talking about?" He says, "I, I saw you know oil down there on the exhaust. Well, it had a very, very, very slight leak at the back corner because if you know there's a dowel." that you got to work that valve cover up off of it. When, when he was working it up off of that dowel, he managed to, you know, crack it a little bit. But the way the gasket was in there, it looked like it would be okay. But when it running, over a period of time, when it got good and hot, a little bit of oil would drip out of there. And it would make, might have dripped a drop out of that thing every 30 seconds or something, and it was a little drop. It wasn't much. And I said, yeah, yeah, we need to fix that. But this garbage, you better not be safe to drive. It's a bunch of hogwash, you know, because there's always cars with... You know, if you get enough oil on the exhaust or antifreeze, you know, it can catch fire and all that. Yeah, I understand all that. But we got him a new valve cover, and we put it on there and buckled it back on with new gaskets, and everything was fine on that one. But that was a really annoying, aggravating job right there. And uh, you know, like I say, this guy right here was a trooper. He really did a good job on that. Mm -hmm. Now, this one right here, 
this girl was coming in. She goes, I only hear radio static when I'm listening to the radio. And the radio goes, rawr, rawr, and it follows the engine. Uh, doesn't do it with a cassette player or, or CD or whatever it was. Uh, doesn't do it without the engine running. It'll only do it when I'm on the uh, listening to the radio. And I said, well, we got some kind of RFI going on here. So the first thing I did was unplug the alternator. That didn't change the dadgum thing. And I said, we turned the volume up so we could hear that thing buzzing. And so I pulled the wire loose from the ignition module or the coil or something. Anyway, as soon as I killed the ignition system, even though the engine was still turning as it wound down and stopped, uh, I could tell that when I killed the uh, ignition system, the noise was killed with it. So when we pulled the distributor cap off, this little carbon button had come out of here, and it had fell down there, rolling around in there in the top of the rotor. And every time this uh, coil fired, it would basically have to jump a little gap down there, and you had RFI. So anytime you got a negative spark, you're gonna have, uh, you know, radio frequency interference. And we just I found another distributor cap laying in there in the classroom that was exactly the right one. We just stuck this one on there and all the radio noise was gone. Uh, but that was an interesting thing to show the students, you know. And, uh, I kept that cap for a long time so I could bug a vehicle with it if I ever needed to, but I never got a chance to do that again. Anyway, that was an interesting little thing there. That was all of my head for you this time. I actually went back and remade this video because the first, of it, I mean, the first copy of it I made was a little bit longer than this one, but it was not focused the way it should have been because there was a. Well, I've been, I'm using manual focus on my camera here, and I had to manual focus the camera this time, and I didn't manual focus it the way I should have last time, and so I had a fuzzy video, and so I've got to delete my old video and put this one back on there. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, I really enjoy talking to you, and uh, I know that uh, some of you may be on a holiday today, but one way or another, I hope you make a lot of money this week, and I thank you for listening in. Oh.